I'm Jennifer Howard, and I'm a teacher at McGoffin County High School. I teach math. I've been teaching math um, for exactly one half of my life. There's a fun fact of the day. I've been teaching 21 years, so how old am I? So I've been teaching math a while. And as long as I've been teaching math, I've had the privilege of knowing Wilma, knowing Jen. Um, I got my start teaching in a building with them. They were across my hall. They were, they were partners. And I really got the best start in education that anyone really could ask for. So, And I'm privileged to say I am from McGough County. If you've been down the parkway, uh, if you travel the parkway, you notice the construction. But I do hope that you noticed the jewel on the right. And that's our new high school that is opening and uh, looking at all these new classroom designs, I'm super excited about my new classroom. I'm excited about how the furniture in my classroom was inspired by a picture from Miss Vivian, who is up next. She loves classroom design. We studied it a lot uh, with Tom Murray, and um, that has just really opened my eyes to, to um, how we can really reinvent uh, the look of what our schools can look like so that our kids will feel inspired, and even more so, so our teachers feel inspired. So super excited about that drive through. I hope that um, you can come see us in the fall when we open up. I cannot wait to move in. As soon as we get that permit to occupy, I will be in that building. So super excited. But um, those of you who know me, you know that um, I'm super passionate about standards-based grading. And I have been um, grading differently for several years now, and um, because of that, um, I've got to know a lot of people, and lots of people like to send me emails and questions or phone calls, and so that naturally became my project when they said, okay, you need a leadership project, and let's see what you can do to maybe make some change either in your school or in your region or your district. This naturally became my project. Okay, um, so the problem why did I change in the beginning and why is this even my project? All stems from, you know, student achievement, whether it's the CATS test, KCCT or KPREP or ACT, whatever testing system you've been through, I've been through a lot. Um, we just knew that the grades that kids were getting and those achievement scores, there were just some incongruencies in there that could not be explained. And I was not happy about that. I was not happy about kids leaving my classroom as a junior who were not meeting college benchmarks with A's and B's. That, that just did not sit well with me. And because it didn't sit well, I knew something had to change. And I, and I thought the heart of that was within my grading practices. Some of the um, other things that we just knew that, you know, students were not mastering their content. Students were not taking responsibility for their learning. And I've you know, through the years I have found that's because I did it all for them. I took responsibility for their learning. I didn't give them a chance to even step up and take ownership of what they needed to do in my classroom. And we just knew there was a fixed mindset. I'm not good at math. I'm never going to be good at math. My mom's not good at math. My brother's not good at math. I'm not good at math. So all of this was a part of the problem that kind of got me going about, let's make a change. My original plan this year was to expand standards-based grading to all schools in my district. Currently in my district, um, the high school and two elementary schools. So three out of the five, we have teachers who are practicing in different subjects at different grade levels. So I wanted to expand to two other schools, get them kind of going, develop some leadership within those schools. And if not get it going within the school, just cultivate the knowledge of standards-based grading among the teacher leaders that are in the school and people who are go-getters and just get that out there so that if they wanted to lead in that direction that they would have more knowledge so that they could. What does the research say on standards-based grading? Well, if you've not read it, you need to. You need to look up at um, what is happening there because with standards-based grading, we know that the learning targets are driving the instruction. And we also know that <clears throat> it allows teachers to focus on whether your students know what you want them to know. It provides opportunities for variable learning paces because I know not everybody learns at the same rate. You know that. Those rates are as variable as the looks of your kids. I mean, there's just so many variables there with their learning paces that research here tells us that we get different opportunities for those paces with standards-based grading. 
Also, we get a clear indication of what students know, what they don't know. It gives you a clear picture of where your instruction is being effective or ineffective. I can look at an infinite campus. I can go straight down a column. And I can look at those threes. My instruction, straight down threes, I give good instruction on that learning target. But when I go to a learning target where I see some ones and twos and very few threes, guess whose fault that is? That is the hole in my instruction. That's where I know, okay, next year, different activities. Next year, different opportunities for my students must be provided in, for, in order for my students really to master that learning target. Okay? And also, the research tells you that it does reward students who continue to try mastering the information. Because a lot of people are like, how do you get your kids to come in during break to redo a learning target? How do you get your kids to come in at 730 and they ask me. I don't ask them to come in. They ask me. It's all student initiated. Um, you know, one day I was working with a kid during my planning. My planning is the last period of the day. And it feels like a marathon getting to it. But I, it is the last period of the day. And we were working on some things. And the next thing we knew, he missed his bus. So we had to get a ride. I was like, you know what? You're already here. you got to get a ride home. Let's stay to 415. And, you know, after that, he mastered his learning targets, and uh, we did see a five-point jump in his ACT math score, by the way. So that was big. We did. It was, it was impressive. I was so proud of him and his achievement. <clears throat> so what was my plan before this plan? Um, last year, all of this started with um, doing some math teacher training with standards-based grading in my district. And I told you that we already had teachers in um, – two elementary schools who had started, and um, we ended up with um, almost our entire math department switching to standards-based grading. I had a student teacher who um, was actually my student when I talked with Jennifer, and she from Wolf County joined our staff at McGoffin, and um, we have a really good relationship, and she decided after her first year she was going to switch to that because she saw in my classroom when she observed me how that was really working through her internship year. So there was a massive training district-wide. Um, our district leadership and our school leadership has been very um, open to trusting me and the research that I've done on standards-based grading and allowing me to be a leader. So um, I really have them to thank for that. And, and they really trust me when they say, okay, we're going to do a two-day training and we want you to do it. And out of that two-day training, we walked all of our teachers through the process of how to get started. And we really went, we went to the bones. We went back to the curriculum, back to the learning targets. Are they really deconstructed? So we really tried to just clarify what we were teaching and what those learning targets were before we even started looking at um, how to do the grading, how to manage infinite campus. So you can see here, I told you, four out of five started using. Um, others began to explore. We now have a biology teacher who's using standards-based grading. And all of our juniors, I said last time, are so mad that they didn't get to do that last year in biology because they like the idea of being able to look at the content, have a chance to practice what they did not master, and then have another chance to show what they have learned. So we have that going on in our elementary schools. We have um, a fifth-grade teacher at North McGoffin who... Um, on her own took all of this on and switched. And my son was in her class last year, and she has done a terrific job. Her name is Cindy Collins. If you're an elementary teacher and you're wondering how that can be done at that level, uh, just hit her up through email, and she can help you out. She's very good with sharing her information and what she has done. So what have been the results this year? Um, our administrators have taken our assessment data. And we put through, what did they get? Distinguished, novice, proficient, apprentice. And right beside of it, made a column of what grade did they get in their class. And it's eye-opening. If you haven't done that, we, and we did that with sub, all subjects. We did that with biology. We did that with Algebra 2. I'm proud to say that Algebra 2 matched up better than the biology because our Algebra 2 teachers were using standards-based grading for the very first time. I've done it with my honors algebra two for years, but our non-honors population had never had the chance to use standards-based grading. Who possibly needs it more than anyone? So what happened after one year of using standards-based grading with our algebra two EOCs? We almost cut our novice rate in half. And I think that's power. 
that's very powerful. When you look at the numbers, there's power in the numbers. And obviously with the math teacher, data speaks to me. And I like using data to guide my instruction. That's what standards-based grading is all about. And it helps inform decisions. So even if people think it's more work, which I do not, um, there's proof that it works with our kids in our school. I can't wait to see the data in the fall after we take our EOC on May 18th. I'll be glad when that day's over. But um, I'm, I'm anxious to see after our teachers have had two years of implementing standards-based grading, if their practices have been refined and they've gotten better at it, if our, if our achievement scores are a little bit better. I do know our ACT scores are on the rise. So I showed you the data. I told you they'd started standards-based grading, and it really was the only change that was made. They did not change their instructional practices. They changed how they grade. And when I say standards-based grading, they changed how they grade. Within that, there's target practice. Within that, there is developing the growth mindset that a student must have and a teacher must have in order to do this well. And they redefined, uh, you know, really what success looks like and really what learning looks like. Learning is messy. And we all know that we have learned more from all the things we've done poorly in our lives than the things we did correctly. And we've learned about protect productive struggle. Those of you involved with Gates Grant and involved with the MDC, we know what productive struggle is. But our kids really have, have realized that mastering those targets, getting that three, in the elementary they go on a four-point system, really is messy. And sometimes it takes hard work and it takes grit. And I'm proud to say our kids are developing more perseverance than they've ever had because of standards-based grading. So what have I done? Did I meet my goals of trying to get leadership in all schools? No, not necessarily. And I did feel bad about that. And Jen kind of had to give me a little pep talk. But some of the things we were able to accomplish this year is some roundtable discussions, some standards-based grading, action network meetings. Um, I felt like we filmed an episode of Naked and Afraid the day <laughs> that – it should be titled that on the holler – the day that I allowed um, – Bernadette talks, can talk me into anything. I allowed her to bring in a camera crew, and we did a live feed of my class because I really don't feel like I do anything special with my kids. I feel like I give them what they need. I don't, and I feel like people watching on a computer screen may not be able to appreciate the work that they do because it's not about the work that I do. It's about the work that my kids do. And uh, but anyway, it is on the hauler. And somebody said, oh, don't worry. Nobody goes on the hauler anyway. I'm like, yes, they do. <laughs> yes, they do. But we did have that that afternoon. We had a Skype session. I was able to answer some questions. And um, it was interesting that someone showed up for the Skype session who only had the notes that their principal took as he watched my lesson live. And she scared me when she said, I just can't believe what I'm reading. And I, I, I kind of lost my breath for a second. And I'm like, okay, well, what did he write? And she said, I can't believe that your kids take so much ownership of their own learning within your classroom. And I said, well, that's just the way things are, you know, in my room. You know, I put the power in their hands, and they take the ownership. They make my job easy. And if, if for some reason, if Mr. Skaggs ends up turning in those papers that are on his desk for retirement, and I get a new principal who wants me to go back to my to the traditional grading system of giving points for this and for that. I will have to leave McGovern County High School. I, I can't change because I've seen my kids change as learners. He allowed me, he allowed me to do something that he did he knew very little about, and he supported me. And I cannot change. I will not change. So. Um, those of you who are lucky enough to work for an administrator that allows you to kind of go outside the box, be thankful for that. I've been thankful for that. Very thankful. Oh, and by the way, our administrators love standards Joyce grading so much that we have explored um, expanding to the language arts classrooms. And uh, so that is happening. They've been working very hard. They had some awesome PLC meetings. I have not had to lead them. They are leading themselves, which I'm thinking, I'm such a good leader. I don't even have to lead them. So, I mean, that's true leadership when you don't have to do anything and they're doing all the work, right? So they are doing that, and I'm so excited to see how that's going to end up and what they get accomplished over the summer. And that's with some help from um, a teacher out at Jessamine County. 
So if you're interested in that, that's who we've been kind of working with on that. Next steps. We want to continue our uh, professional action network meetings in the fall for anyone else who wants to learn. I have found that it's easier to work with initiatives for people who want to change. Uh, We had the privilege of listening to Mike Rutherford um, through the ALL group, and he gave an equation, spoke to my heart, that talked about how change occurs. I love it when people take things and put it into math. I can really dig into that. And one of the pieces was dissatisfaction, and it was multiplication. What is zero times anything? Zero. And when dissatisfaction is zero, when there is no satisfaction, zero times any initiative you're doing equals how much change? Zero. And that spoke volumes to me. And and it, it, it sounds silly, but if, if you are not satisfied, that is, that is where you start. Because if your satisfaction, if you're not dissatisfied is what I'm saying, if you're What am I trying to say? I'm trying to explain math, and and I'm messing it up. doesn't sound very good, does it? Uh, But anyway, when we're at zero with our dissatisfaction, we cannot change. But when that is really great, you have that multiplier going on, and and things just change happens in a big way. That's what I'm trying to say. Okay? But that's it. Any questions? Okay, well, what I do, well, what I do actually <clears throat> is not mastery learning in a way. Mastery learning, some people think, is I cannot move on until I've mastered a concept. That is not what we do. We still move on, but we are um, basing every assessment and what happens between retakes of those assessments based upon the results of how they performed, the evidence they gave us on a learning target. But we do move on at any point in the nine weeks or the semester. Mr. Skaggs lets me repost my grades on Infinite Campus. I can go back. And if I have a kid that comes to me and say, you know what? I was really stressed out during this unit. And you have already posted grades. Is there anything I can do about this? And I'm like, well, yeah. You know, that I can, I can have the, the counselors love me. Not sometimes, because I'm emailing and saying, can you, turn, can you turn this back on so I can repost, so I can update. This kid now has a three in this learning target, and I want that to be reflected in their GPA. Well, it, it is. It, some people think mastery learning is you cannot move on until you have mastered a previous concept, and we are not doing that. We still move on. Mm-hmm. But um, we've had some, some issues with that in our district where people, I think, confused what standards-based grading was and not moving on with mastery and and they failed to allow the practice to happen in their classroom. They had a bad experience with it. So, yes. Okay.